welcome back guys so I'm preparing to image a target tonight uh, we're getting some clear sky for a few hours anyway not the full night uh, so the first thing I generally do is to open up Stellarium uh, flick forward until we get to sort of where it's getting a bit darker which is for me at the minute is pretty late on to be honest um, so I had a quick scout about earlier and I was kind of torn between the sombrero galaxy which is coming up and it would come up would be quite low but I would be able to shoot it right through until I reckon about 2 a.m. whenever the clouds are going but I think what won me over whoops I do that nearly every time I try to search for the iris nebula is the iris nebula this is one of my favorite targets I've yet to get a good what I'm a picture that I'm happy with so I can see that it, it is clearing my fence. In fact, it's probably cleared it already. But um, I'll have a wee look and see what the what it looks like as it moves throughout the night. So it's moving away from the meridian, which is good for me because it means I don't have to recolumn it after a flip. And it's not moving massively far. So I think I will have a nice wee shot at that tonight. So at 2 a.m. again, there's no problems there. So now start a new sequence. So this is running from scratch with nothing else there. So we go to Tools, Framing a Mosaic Wizard, and we will go to Iris, Nebula, 2 degrees, hit Fetch. Now it'll go off on to the internet. That is a wee bit quicker as I did do a test run of this before I made the video. Um, so check everything here looks good. If we click on, it'll give me... So I will center in the middle and we'll click Create Sequence. I will replace as this is a new target, so I don't need the current default one. And I'll untick auto rotate as uh, I don't have a rotator. This is my warning that I wish I could get rid of. So this should pop up. So this looks good. The first stage I always do is to click slow to, because I would like it to go to it straight away at the start of the sequence. Then I'll go in and I'll change. I'll change it to this folder which I just created, which is today's date. And all of the data I collect will go in there. So now we're down into what is our exposure. So I'll be using ISO 400. Um, you know, well, what do we need to do? It's, it's hard to guess really, unless you've imaged it before, which luckily for me, I have. I imaged it recently. So this is going to be on another, on my previous server before I set this one up. So if you go to Astro Images, Iris. And I got a good night on this. I mean, I got 88 targets, and I think this was three minutes each. So that's quite a lot of data. So here's a shot from a quarter past three in the morning. So let's see what the ADU of this will be. So that's 982, which is within my my desired range. So normally I aim for between 500 and 1,000, and there is some maths, and that will be on my website of how you work all that out for your specific camera. So. Based on this being 3 minutes at ISO 200, if I have moved up to ISO 400, the equivalent to that would be 1.5 minutes, which is obviously very, very short. So we'll just have a quick look at this image to see what I'm talking about. You can see that only the brightest stars are visible in the unstretched image, which means that those are the areas where we have overexposed and there is no data other than full brightness at the very center of these stars. You won't get, you don't really get a smooth trail off. It's just all of that data is gone. So we don't want that. So we try to minimize as much of that as possible. So I would think that I'm probably going to be forced to go with a two minute exposure. I don't think I want to go any, any less than that. If I look, if I compare this to a picture from, from uh, almost 11 o'clock, just to let you see the difference in brightness. So there's 1408, which is substantially brighter. Again, the sun had only went down, so it wasn't a fully dark sky at that stage. We can then come up to, say, 1 o'clock in the morning, and that should be somewhere in the middle, I would have thought. 1120, so not far off the middle. So what we'll do is we will close the easy test images, as we don't need them any longer, and we'll open up the sequence. And I'm going to go with two minute exposures and lots of them so if I have five hours let's see how 
So 100 exposures gives me a 3 hours 20. So let's take that up higher. And we'll maybe, I'm going to put it up as far as 500. So that's 16 hours of shots. And I think that's probably nearly what I would need to do to get a final image. I know that's going to be very intensive in the processing, stitching all that together. But my the, pro, the computer that I use for stitching my uh, photos together is, is fairly powerful Xeon processor. So it can handle it. So that is pretty much you ready to go. So now what I will do is save the sequence. And I'm going to call this, I normally do Iris Nebula. And I like to date before the target. And that's, that's just how I do them. I will save that off. And that is me ready to go. I have already collimated. Um, I'll show you what I generally do for collimation. I know a lot of people are big into collimating all the time, every hour. Temperature changes, uh, and it can be people can be a bit fanatic about it. I am less bothered. So what I will do is I will take it round to we'll go to the Iris Nebula. And really, what I do is I look at where is this, where is my target going to go? So in the time that I'm going to be looking at it, it's going to come up here. So what I will do is I will back to normal speed and I will since we're still in daylight turn the sky off and I know that it moves in and around this area so what I do is I pick somewhere in the middle and I will screw my scope to that point and I will use my laser collimator to collimate for that point and as a test that I have done previously I have taken it back to the start and went to the end and seen how much the collimation varies over my imaging run and to be honest for that sort of a movement it's not going to vary massively where I have noticed problems would be where you're crossing a meridian and the scope will actually flip on the other side and I, th I found that that can move it again not hugely but it does move it a bit and that's probably down to mirror flop and there's not a great deal I can do about that so that's me ready to go and I will probably create a another video later on and maybe stitch all them all together so thanks for listening Okay, welcome back. Um, I'm following on from the video I did earlier about starting up a new sequence on the Iris Nebula. So it is almost dark. I mean, it's still a little bit blue, but some of the brightest stars are visible. So what I've done is I've actually slewed to the target. Um, I actually slewed to Jupiter and got my alignment kind of close to where it needed to be. This was the first time that the system had actually been used with the telescope. So it was expected that there would be a, it would be a bit out. So now I've used Stellarium to come across to, and I don't know how to say this, Procyo. Um I brought it right to the very centre and I synced again, but now I've moved it out because it just, for the next step, it makes it a wee bit easier. So I popped out and I put my Batnoff mask on it. And that doesn't look all that useful. So what we do then is we move into bold mode, one second, 1600 is fine. And we will snap an image. And what we should see is this will become much more clear and we'll see the, the, the diffraction spikes that will allow us to see how well we are focused. Which, looking at that, is pretty close. Especially for this not having been touched in a couple of weeks. So I'm going to open up my motorized focuser. This made my life so much easier. I just, I don't know. Quant port is denied. Okay, so I did swap, swap things around a wee bit earlier. So what I will do is just go and find out which quant port I'm using. So, ports. Oh. That's interesting. I think it is actually Quant Port 3. So let me see. What have I done that would be wrong? Quant Port 3 connect. So it's denying me access. So I wonder whether this would have any such luck. Oh, so why is this not? Let me see it. Hmm. So. I don't know how you actually connect or I've never had to do this before. It is pretty close. I mean, to be honest, I could move on without that. I would be fairly happy with it. But I do need to figure out what's going on with my focuser. So I'm a little bit confused as to why it's not working. What I can do is... Did I close Device Manager? I did. So we'll pull up Device Manager again and just to validate that it is indeed COM port 3. <coughs> Click the lights on in the shed here and I will track back to which of my leads is the focuser so I unplug this 
I should have kept that open, but let's see which of my ports disappear. So it is indeed com port three. I'm hearing lots of beeps there, so I'm probably annoying other things. So it is indeed com port three. So, so I have another issue somewhere, which is a little bit annoying. Okay, so I will have to solve that one a bit. I will pause the video and have a wee fiddle about. Okay, so I still haven't figured out what the problem with my COM port driver is, but what I can do is that I have the manual control box beside me here that, that hooks out into the scope. So I will manually press the buttons and see if I can get this to move. So I'll turn the speed up a little bit. So I'm not seeing much change. Oh, that's terribly annoying. Okay, so that did move a wee bit over to the wrong in the wrong direction. So let's come back and see what we get out of that. So I'm hoping that the central spike will move to the left, which it did. A wee bit too far, so we'll tap it again. I just want to get this somewhere in the ballpark of focus, which that looks to be pretty close to. I'll turn the speed down a wee touch. As SG Pro will take over my focus for me later on. Assuming I can figure this driver problem out. So that looks pretty good to me. And I think we will call it quits at that. So we can abort that live view sequence. And disconnect from the camera. And I will uh, stop the video now as I'm going to go and take the button off mask off. And I'm going to try a full system reboot. As this has been on for a large portion of the day. And has multiple things in and out. So it may have got itself into a bit of a tizzy. Thanks for listening. Uh, welcome back. So this is actually the third part of I'm going to stitch this all together for one long video. Um, the previous one, I rebooted the machine and the focuser connected no problem. I actually had missed a step whenever I tried to connect to SG Pro. I needed to go into the settings button actually and configure it a wee bit more. So I will hopefully summarize that in another video. So what we are now is we're sitting parked in the home position, which for me is horizontal across. Um, I like to have it like that because I actually carry the scope out and it's easier to put it on a scope that is horizontal rather than setting it on when it's vertical. And it means that I don't have to turn the scope or change its position. I can just walk out, set it on, take it off, and when I come back again, it's all fine. So what we're going to do now is this is the, the sequence we created earlier, and we're just going to run the sequence. It's, I mean, it's much too early in that the sky is still a light, sort of a, a lightish blue, so the data that I'll be capturing here will be fairly worthless, but... As this is the first run for this system, uh, this PC, I, I might as well start now and see if there's any bugs come up that need fixing before the before it gets dark and I end up wasting data. So, as we set it all up previously, all I have to do, in fact, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to connect to the equipment manually. There we are. That is everything connected, which is the first hurdle over. So, we're going to hit run sequence. Um, basically what this message is saying is that your telescope is parked. Is it okay if I unpark it? I don't know why you would ever want to say no. Okay. So this will not continue. I've been through this before when I was testing. So I'm going to turn that device off. It's actually still plugged into my other machine. I haven't got around to moving it yet. So same error again. So what it's going to do now is it'll fire up PHD. Mine's connected. Um, it is actually now you can see down here in the bottom that it is slewing to the target. So what we'll do, this is something I do. So this is already connected to all of the equipment. I generally click looping just for no other reason than because I can see stuff. So it's swinging right. It's probably pointed at houses at the minute. So that sounds like we're getting to where we want to be now. So you can see some faint stars here. So there we have our image. Which does look a little bit horrible, but I think it always does, to be honest. So, this is the plate solving inside Pix and Sight. So, it will jump into Plate Solve 2, will pop up here, but imagine on the left. So, there she comes. Um, it's inputted, obviously, all the sizes and bits and pieces from my, from my camera profile. So, this might fail on the first run, which is, to be honest with you, fairly normal, especially for something where the scope's been on and off a few times. So what it'll do is it'll fail over to the blind solver, which will take a few minutes, and it will actually upload this 
think mine is set for remote solve, so it will upload this to the astronomy.net server, and it should come back in a wee minute with with the location. That will correct it, and then it will. Uh, the next one will probably pass. Okay, so if we look, do we actually see anything there, which is a bit worrying. Normally, you would see some bright stars in the image. So perhaps the sky is just too bright. So I may have to come back to this, and if you leave it for half an hour and come back again. Okay, so it was actually able to solve that. Oh, no, it wasn't. So it failed completely. Uh, so I'm not even sure if it did pass or not. So let's see what happens with this one. Again, it could be that we are just too early in the night and the sky's not dark enough for it yet. So I would imagine that actually did succeed with the remote solve as it f passed almost instantly with plate solve 2, which just disappeared before I could get to it. So it is now resuming the auto guider. So basically that is it. It's doing calibration, which it doesn't normally do for me, but this is quite literally the first time that PhD has ran on this computer. So it will need to do some solving. Apologies, it'll need to do a calibration. So I will pause the video here because I don't think there's much value. This is automated. It will take 20 steps in each direction. It'll do whatever it does. As I'm on a pier, I don't do this very often, maybe once every six months. So I'll pause the video and I'll come back once it's finished. Okay, so the calibration is complete. Um, now we can see, see what, we'll actually see how well it's going to guide for tonight. Again, with it not being totally dark yet, and there is quite a bit of light haze up above, um, I wouldn't expect it to be massive, massively great. So now, Sequence Generator Pro is going to run at autofocus using the Moonlight Focuser. Basically, what it does is, I think I have it set to nine. It takes nine images and it tries to get a nice V so that it knows where the focus point is. More often than not, it doesn't get in what it says is an asymmetric V. So that's basically a V with equal equal slopes. So it doesn't get that. It tends to get ones a bit less than the other. So it actually defaults to the lowest half half width full maximum. I can't remember the words for it. So this is it taking images and you can see the image in the background. I have mindset that it will do this now every every half hour or so. Uh, I actually didn't switch this on for about a year of having my focuser. I can't exactly explain why, other than I thought, oh maybe maybe it won't work or maybe it'll cause me hassle. So I didn't do it, and I should have switched it on because I quite literally you just enable it and it just works. It has never failed me yet, and even if, even if it can't find. The, focus, the best focus point, you can't find something new, it rolls back to the previous. So you, you lose nothing. And I have noticed quite dramatic changes in the focus numbers from the start of the night to the end of the night. Something that I would never even have considered before. So it is running away here. And we'll see how we get on. Um, I, that looks about right. It's in around the 500s. is where I normally am. I like to keep what I normally do here is, oh, actually, oh, it's not on this computer. I'll have to create one. I actually note down what the focus point was each night that I use it. Just, I would like to see, I think, with these focusers, they're not direct drive. They have, like, a, a drive that is a spinning bush against the column, like the, like the center of the focuser tube. So there is a potential for a little bit of slip. So I find that over time, the focus position does tend to wander. Um, I, I can't quantify exactly how much, but I think that it would need to be, you couldn't just use exactly the same focus point from one night to the next but as a long-term approach. From, from tonight to tomorrow night to the night after, it's probably going to be pretty much the same. But uh, from a, a month from now, the number will be drastically different. So that looks like it's starting to head back up. I'd hope to see a nice steep jump on the next image and if we get to see that it should punch in the the other slope line so we currently have 
that orangish yellow line orange yellow so we don't have anything as yet so it actually ran past its nine shots you can see at the bottom it has 111 percent so that's basically one extra image so it will keep trying and see where it gets to so now it has got something there it'll probably do another one or two images just to see if it can get an asymmetric slope which to be fair that isn't that far off and then once this is complete then it should I believe resume the guider so it's happy with that it didn't get an asymmetric uh, slope so I will be getting an email very shortly to say the autofocus has failed and it is using the lowest the lowest weighted average method so now it is saying that the auto guider is settling so we have the auto guider graph up here and I like to keep an eye on that that does look a little bit erratic but this is life so we're in within plus or minus one the total is 0.88 arc minutes which for me is less than a pixel which I'm going to be honest I'm good with that anything less than a pixel of deviation keeps me happy so now it is integrating the first image so we can close this as so we won't need it and I will pause the video and I'll come back again once we have our first frame okay so this is the first image that is back I'll just check that I'm recording yeah so this is the first image that's back you can see the ADU is extremely high I would want it to be at most about a thousand or so but again it's not totally dark yet so I'm not too worried uh, if I do an auto stretch on it I'll see nothing so what I can do I cannot do because I was going to load up PixInsight but I'll maybe do that later on it's actually on a different machine I use it if this is the my new idea for this setup is that I want uh, one box to control my telescope and the other box to control my uh, to allow me to process my images my main reason for this is that I've always been too scared to start stacking images or, or monkeying about with them in case something goes wrong and the machine crashes I mean it is a vastly powerful machine but if it crashed it would mean I would lose you know an hour's imaging by the time I got it put it up and everything set up again so I choose not to risk that but looking at that image I mean it's certainly not overexposed that will be almost certainly will be this the core of the Aris Nebula it looks lovely and centered compared to what we have here I'm not losing too much detail in the center you know that is lovely and small and I look forward to seeing what end result we get so I'm just going to uh, call the video now and I, I don't know if I will continue on I might bring another video showing the results tomorrow but thank you for listening guys welcome back so this is the next morning um, the system ran as expected till about half two I think it was let me just check around I think it was around 40 images we ended up with did some changes after I stopped the video so I found that 120 um, was getting too dim and I could probably push it further so I ended up with about four minutes so 44 times four minutes so that's probably maybe a quarter of what I need but at least it's something so what we will do is I'm about to start my lights and I'll just show you what set of setup I use for my lights so let's not do it with that um, open with so this is just my telescope camera hasn't been moved so it's still attached <clears throat> this is an LED tracing pad off eBay it runs off 12 volts so you can actually use it out with the telescope if uh, that suits you better I like it th th this way because generally I image all night and leave it running when I'm in bed and when I come out everything's soaking I can get condensation and mirrors and things so I set it here let it dry out and then I can do flats whenever it suits me so just to see what settings we need I could look this up on the other machine but I'm not going to I want to put these in the same folder yeah that's great I'm already connected to my camera we change this to be flat so that it knows not to use the mount uh, 0 0.01 let's see what that looks like CMI so so if we go to I want to make this a hundred just so that I can pause it 
So let's see. So we're hoping for much higher than that. I would normally go in and around the uh, 1800 mark. So we know to come up by, say, three times that, which would give us not one, not three. So let's see what we got there. Oops, 21, so that's fine. I think that'll do me for the old histogram people. There's it's nearly halfway in. So what we can do is we'll change this up to 101, hit resume, and I'll just leave it running. I'll pause the video and I'll go back into the house and get some breakfast made. Okay, I've just come back and it seems to have finished, which is great. So if we open up the folder, have a quick peek. Be blank there. I couldn't remember where I was going to. Okay, so that's my flat. So I will actually use something I created last night. I almost created it in another machine. So we'll have a new folder and we'll call this flats. Okay, and we'll create one called light. I'm probably not going to use all of those. I'll probably not process the two minute and three minute ones. And then we'll create another folder called master. So just to get this packaged up, well, the masters are on the other one as well. So we can rename this folder, we'll call this virus nebula. And I like to date. the data so that I can look back and know what was taken and what night from a high level without having to go into the folder. So that now is ready to push across onto the other machine for processing. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I could show you while I'm here. I think that's everything. So we'll disconnect the camera. And close it down. Uh, actually I will save this sequence. So I'll put a wee underscore it to take it to keep it at the top of the list. So we'll call it flats and save it. I think that's really everything. Um, we're heading out for today. The kids take them to the zoo, but I'll come back and have another video later on on how to use the batch pre-processing -pre script in PixInsight to show what the data what the data would look like if I was actually going to process it. But I won't. I will just calibrate it, and then I can stack it with data from another night at some future point. Thanks for listening.